Now, they and their descendants were very engaged in the cause of Ukrainian independence and freedom. They were people who spent the last several decades of the last century, the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, organizing halls and newspapers, Home in Ukraine, League, Canadian League for the Liberation of Ukraine, and so on, all aimed at freeing Ukraine from Soviet oppression. That was the goal. That clearly was their cause. They were opposed by very few people from within their wave. They were opposed by some on the left who were already established in Canada. But in the context of the Cold War, they obviously had an advantage. They were anti-Soviet, anti-communist, whereas those who were criticizing them and calling them Nazis and collaborators and so on were coming from the left and so didn't have that much resonance with the government of Canada. Many of us, myself certainly, Alexander Kitschi and others I recognize in this room, Pavlo, have spent much of the rest of our lives mopping up behind that third wave. The issue of war criminals in Canada, the issue of Soviet <coughs> war crimes. These are all issues that emerged out of that third wave and became a cause for the descendants of the DPs and in fact gave our community some of its greatest issues and I would say even triumphs in the last half century or so. Meanwhile, let's get back over there in the old country in Ukraine. I don't have to detail, I think, the outrages, the catastrophes, the war, the genocide that was aimed at the Ukrainian nation. Exiles from over there, before, during, and after the Second World War, were political immigrants. And their color was inevitably somehow based in relationship to the predominant color of Ukraine from 1921 to 1991, which was red. So although we saw some exiles come in the 20s and 30s who were blue, uno, many who came after the Second World War who were clearly blue patriots, Ukraine itself was red. And it was only until 2004 that we saw its colors start to shift along the spectrum from red to orange. And now, unfortunately, I have to admit, they're yellow. <laughs> Ukraine, to me, right now, is in its yellow face. Uh, I'd hoped they'd skip forward the blue, but they haven't done it. And so we are faced, as observers from afar, from over here, watching the various political stupidities that interest some, but frankly for me, and I think many of you, are uh, beyond comprehension or interest. I don't want to focus in on the coming elections in Ukraine. I, I, that's not my thing. I want to look at some of the broader, larger issues that I think we need to sort of think about when we talk about what is our cause. And I want to compare and contrast with others who've got causes of their own. So, of course, one of the first things I'm going to talk about is the issue of the whole of the morning and its commemoration. How do we hallow the memory of the many millions of Ukrainians who died during this genocidal great famine? Well, what's happened in Ukraine? Very little. A law was passed in 2006 declaring that the whole the more was an act of genocide. In 2006, November, we're now essentially almost in 2010. That law has still not been translated officially into English. How can a government of 50 million people declare something to be genocide, not even translate that most fundamental of documents into English? Stidheimba. Ukraine endured genocide, war, population displacements, ethnic cleansing, if you like. Compare the Jewish diaspora. Israel was created and almost immediately embroiled in a war after the Holocaust. Millions of Jews perished. They went into exile, having survived their Holocaust, and yet within a few years had set up a memorial complex, Yad Vashem, that is today one of the leading promoters of the notion of the unique suffering, as they like to put it, of the Jewish people during the Second World War. Meanwhile, some two decades after independence, very little has been done in independent Ukraine to commemorate what I would argue is one of the greatest acts of genocide to befell 20th century European history. The notion that other countries should accept and recognize the whole of the war as an act of genocide was very much promoted last year by the government of Ukraine. And yet, quite frankly, we can fool ourselves if we like, very few countries in the world have accepted it. 
The United States does not recognize the Holodomor as an act of genocide. Great Britain does not recognize the Holodomor as an act of genocide, nor does France, nor does Germany. And in fact, in Israel, in January of this year, and there's an article by me that's up at the front, you can read it if you like, one of the spokesmen for the Israeli Foreign Ministry said clearly, the Holodomor was a tragedy, we recognize that a tragedy occurred, but there is only one genocide, and that's ours. There's been no effort to bring the perpetrators of some of these Soviet crimes against humanity to justice to this day. There's no memorial complex. And in fact, when our own Ukrainian World Congress wrote a letter to the government of Israel in May of this year, protesting that comment by that Israeli deputy minister, um, they, to this moment, have no response. So, we have causes emerging. What are those causes? Well, if you believe the cause, as I said, was a cause of Ukrainian independence in 1991 that was secured, you can go home. If, on the other hand, you believe the cause is Ukraine's freedom, not just its independence, but its freedom, then I think you should continue to remain engaged within the organized Ukrainian community because clearly Ukraine is not free right now. But how do you do that? And here's where I'm going to sort of take us perhaps a little bit beyond where we contemplated uh, this discussion going. It's all very nice for me to come up here and give a little kind of what I call, excuse the expression, piss and vinegar speech and get everybody stirred up, and then I go home. <coughs> what good comes out of that? If you believe that the cause is Ukraine's freedom, then how do we achieve that freedom? How, what, what should we be doing as a community here in Canada to help, to assist, to support the ongoing, continuing struggle for Ukrainian freedom. I think we can find an answer to this question in sort of the tale of two men. And again, I can't go into any great detail on it, but I've mentioned one of them already, Bogdan Panchuk, who wrote a memoir called Heroes of Their Day, which you can find it in the library here in several libraries across Canada. Another man, Stanley Froelich, who wrote a memoir, Between Two Worlds, also widely available. These two men did not always like each other. <coughs> Panchuk called Froelich the playboy type, and he was. Um, Froelich looked at Panchuk and said, country bumpkin, and he was. Um, and yet, both of them achieved remarkable things. Stanley Froelich, as a member of Moon, the young Ukrainian nationalist, which was attached to UNO at the time, uh, walked across Siberia from Halichina to escape the Soviets, got out through Japan, came back to Toronto, did a degree at the University of Toronto, then went overseas just at the end of the war and worked with Panchuk to help rescue the DPs, and in particular to help rescue Bandarivchi, and brought them all to Canada, including Dmitro Donsov, and established the League at home in Ukraine, and did all of that as a Teranovi Provinik, kind of super spy underneath, of Oumbe. Some of that may be known to you, some of it may not be known to you, but the reality is he did these things. Voldan Panchuk, soldier, teacher, member of the Ukrainian Self-Reliance League, raised in that tradition of uh, dedication to the community, wrote in his own diary, I have a simple gospel, do something, Rubishrush. So what did he do? He created the Central Ukrainian Relief Organization, the Ukrainian Canadian Servicemen's Club, got involved in Legion Affairs, and worked all his life to ensure that the Ukrainian community in Canada would be strong. Now, if I, I met both these men, I loved both these men, I was privileged to have met both these men, they've changed my life. Sometimes I used to like Froelich more, sometimes I used to like Panchuk more, I kind of, you know, conflict. When I was in my Playboy type mode much long years ago, um, I liked Froelich more, then I thought a community <laughs> activist, I became more Panchuk. Um, I liked them both. And I'm sure both of them, in 1991, would have said, we've achieved independence. They would have shook hands on that, because they did, uh, could have looked each other in the eye and said, well done, we've stayed the course, we've endured, and we've won. But I think Panchuk, much more so than Froelich, would now ask me to look around and say, okay, so we have an independent Ukraine, we've had an independent Ukraine for 20 years, what do we have here to show for it? For all that effort, for all that organizational work. How many senators do we have who are Ukrainian heritage when we have 1.2 million people? 
how many of our people, you and me, have been appointed to some of the federal boards? How many of us are recipients of the Order of Canada? How many of us have posts at universities? 